Hey everybody, Pete with you here. It is December 30th, it's Friday, and it is a beautiful day. Where am I today? Where is this day trip taking us? Well, in Towson, Maryland. I am at the historic Hampton Historical Mansion, which is behind me here, but also next to me is my friend Matt Berry, who also has a YouTube channel and does indie films. How you doing, Matt? Good, good. Glad for you to, he's the one that made the suggestion as far as to come here and check it out. And it is the perfect day for checking it out. You excited about this? Oh yeah. Yeah? I've what been, do you? I've been enjoying Pete's uh, vlogs. So I was uh, thrilled when he asked me to come along and uh, with him on this one and to check out this place. I appreciate you coming along. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So we got tickets for the tour. It's not until one o'clock, which is about uh, an hour and a half or so away. So we're gonna walk the grounds now and check things out and you're gonna come with us. Let's go. So this is the front of the Hampton Mansion right here. Look at how beautiful it is. Look at the architecture. And this was built, what was, what was the date again, Matt? Between, between 1783 to 1790. Between 1783 and 1790. We have some other people walking around here. Like I said, it's a beautiful day for December 30th the eve before the eve of new year and we're checking out the grounds now we're gonna walk around we got a map as well to check things out and that's what we're gonna do now so these little buildings right here they tell you on this historical sign here what they are so that right there is this, it's a garage. It's built in 1910. And we got a shed, which is right there. Also a storage shed, which is there. Zoom in a little. And then the privy, privies. They were multi-seat outhouses or sanitary facilities back are trap doors for cleaning. Well, how about that? Took a walk out back of the mansion and here's what it looks like. Check this out. How cool is that? So we came across this, uh, tree stump here and wow what do you think matt that's pretty old one. yeah i was i was trying to see if you can see the ring and that's how you determine the yeah. age right yep. there's got to be <laughs> hundreds of yeah. rings there my goodness that is that was a big tree at some point amazing really yep I'm just curious how old that tree was. So right now we're gonna go right and head toward the cemetery. And then when we come back, we're gonna go that way. Check out the farm. So we made it to the cemetery. That's it right there. And here's some information about it on this historical marker here. And it tells you in memoriam, and it also tells you down here, this gated cemetery where generations of Ridgely's are buried is still in use by the family. Feel free to enter and walk among the tombstones. That's what we are gonna do. Right, you ready to do this? Yeah. All right, yeah. let's go check it out. And we're going through the iron gates. Wow, check this out. My viewers know that I love cemeteries, especially old ones like this. That's a little more current right there. Yeah, you can see we have some more recent yeah. days here. Yeah, like look at this one, August 4th, 2012. Andrew's still around though. Here's a Ridgely. 
There's my shadow, too, in the way. 1993 is when Dorothy Pell Ridgely passed away. This one looks interesting over here. Juliana Elizabeth. Yeah, I like these old markers here. Born August 25th, 1821. Very young, died in 1853. Here's a nice one here for John Campbell, son of Henry and Mary Leroy White. Born November 20th, 1825 and died in February 6th, 1853. Yeah, what a... What you got here, Matt? I just noticed this right here, Helen Stewart Ridgely. Looks like she lived to be 102 years old, 1877 to 1979. Wow, that is a long yeah. life. I guess just shy of 102 years. It looks like she's uh, January 79. Yeah, that is a long life. God bless you, Helen. We don't know who's in here, though, do we? No, But over here, Howard Ridgely. I was just saying earlier, it was really remarkable that the uh, craftsmanship that goes into these, uh, especially these older yeah. headstones. Well, we saw back there with the book, you know, the level on top of the, I guess it's a Bible on top, the uh, level of detail is really stunning. It is. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I love looking at, at some of them because a lot of them are different, and you're right, there's a lot of work and uh, structure put into them, you know, especially that one back there, you know. All right, so we just left the graveyard. What did you think? Oh, it was beautiful, beautiful headstones. Yeah, some pretty old ones in there too. Yeah. So now we're heading down toward the farm. Check that out, see what this farm is all about. But again, we're just enjoying this beautiful day yeah quite a contrast from last weekend yeah. what was it uh six to eight degrees yeah yeah <laughs> my goodness get down to the single digits it, it's supposed to get yeah. in the 50s today and it feels pretty good right now yeah. walking around we don't need jackets no. or anything like that the rain is coming anyway back to this tour we're headed to the farmhouse let's go check it out so this right here in front of me is a stable and it says here that it was constructed in 1805. That's the one on the left. The one on the right, which is there, was constructed in 1857. But it also tells us here that some of the finest thoroughbred horses in the country lived in the stable to our left, which is that one right there. Postboy and Tuckahoo. <laughs> and look, here's a picture. This is from 1912, right here. Gear for the carriages and horses hangs here as it would have in the coach house. There they are back there. just came from that way so to get to where we want to go next we have to cross the street this is the first thing that we saw when we cross the street yeah. Do we looks know what it is me, it looks like this might be the dairy is it yeah looks like it we can go down these steps here get a closer look In we go. Gotta be 
careful with when we walk. There's bars on the window. Chili in here. Yeah. <laughs> and what was this called again? I believe this is a dairy. A dairy. Uh, that's all that, but whatever it was, it definitely wasn't good for keeping things cool. Yeah, I can it's see. It's a rainy house. Yeah. There's a fireplace here. One. Let's walk around this way. Steps up here to get out. And there's a sign over here, so let's go take a look at that. So this sign here explains everything. And Matt was right, it was for dairy. So it says the ingenious design of this building enabled the Ridgely's to produce fine dairy products here for 150 years. Built into the ground to maintain coolness the structure is also shaded by low hanging eaves. Inside you will see a natural refrigeration system. And we did see that when we went inside. So we made our way over to this area here. Matt's gonna tell us about it. All right, so I think what we're looking at right here, looks like on the map is called the lower house. And I believe the stone buildings here are the workers' quarters. I see something really small back there. Almost kind of oh, yeah. a large like doghouse, if you will. But it, I know it's not. Maybe there's it's for storage. Yeah, there's something on the map here lab labeled Dove Coat. I don't know what that is. It's a, a small uh, a small dot on the map, so that might be it. I don't know. We did that or the building next to it. Well, we'll go take a closer look right yeah. now. This is inside the farmer's home right here. It tells you about it. This room is furnished to suggest a tenant farmer's house at the turn of the 20th century. Check out this bed. Here they talk about the persistence of racism. It says here at Hampton, black as well as white tenant farmers and farmer laborers continue to be employed into the 20th century. The sign here talks about the freedom for slaves back in 1864. And it says that it brought its own difficult challenges. Freed slaves had few assets and little or no education. Most were literate with farming skills. From their years of enslavement, many entered contracts with landowners and former masters as tenant farmers or sharecroppers. There's a picture there. And another one over here. This right here is the lower house. And it tells us a little bit about it right down here. But if you look, there's a bell up there at the top there and it tells us that the bell atop the lower house called the enslaved into and out of the field and it also tells us that Hampton's first master Captain Charles Ridgely lived in this house before the mansion was completed 
This right here is the mule barn. And this is where they drank out of, right here. And that right there in front of us is what's left of the corn crib that unfortunately burned down in 1989. Here's a picture down here of what it looked like. And that's all that's left of it. We're gonna start making our way back because it's getting close to one o'clock and time for the tour of the mansion. So we are now back at the mansion and there's people waiting to do the tour and we're gonna go join them in a second. We just are resting a little bit after doing quite a bit of walking. So what'd you think so far? I, I just keep saying it's just beautiful. I didn't know all this was back here. Uh, it's the first time I've actually been out uh, to this Hampton National Historic Site despite driving by many, many times over the years. And I'm just taking it all in and enjoying it a lot. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the, the inside of this beautiful mansion. We're gonna go join them here right now. So welcome to Hampton. This is the home of the Ridgely family. And it's significant because six generations of Ridgely's lived here. This was their summer home, if you can imagine. Um, they lived in Baltimore. And um, it was, the house was built in 1790. It took seven years to build. And you have to think back then they didn't have scaffolding the way we have it today or I don't know enough about construction but nail guns you know all the all the things that you use for construction now um, they just had very skilled enslaved people that um, built this house basically the house is 25,000 square feet we can't go up at, we can, we're only gonna be on this floor but the second floor has six bedrooms the third floor has ten bedrooms and then there's a cupola, um, big, you know, few, full basement underneath, which is where they had a, a Madeira collection. Um, so anyhow, the Ridgelys were not famous, uh, really, at all. They made their money mining iron ore. Um, if you travel a little bit further north on Delaney Valley Road, you all probably came in on Delaney Valley Road. If you go uh, maybe one or two miles further north, there's a sign on the right-hand side that says Northampton Iron Works. They owned that and discovered that they had iron ore and they supplied, their made, they made their money supplying iron ore to, um, during the Revolutionary War and War of 1812, making cannonballs. Um, and the soldiers, you know, in the camping, their, their uh, cooking equipment and things like that. So they made a whole lot of money. So they weren't famous, but they were Bill Gates wealthy. They were really, really wealthy. Um, they lived in Baltimore, as I said, um, and it you have to think also in 1790, it took a half, a five to six hours by carriage to get here. Um, now we complain because it's a half hour, if there's, you know, more than a half hour or whatever, but five to six hours because it was a little rutted road, you know, to get here. And um, they, it would be cooler, it's up on a hill a little bit, you know, open the windows, they didn't have screens, of course, lots of flies probably, but it would, you know, it would have been cooler. And um, they did spend the holidays here too. Um, so that's why it's sort of, you know, they decorated it for Christmas as well. Um, the house is Georgian in style, which means that if we cut it right in half here, those sides are identical. So you came in on the west hyphen when we go to the kitchen, that's the east hyphen. You notice the doorways are opposite each other. That was very, a very English uh, way of building. And this was said to be the grandest house in North America at the time. Mount Vernon could fit inside here. The, you know, George Washington's house. It's, it, it was really quite elegant. Their, their winter home was not this big at all. Um, in the heyday, in the height of their wealth, they owned 24,000 acres. So if we could go to the cupola and look east and north, um, as far as you can see, they own. Those of you who are from this area, they owned uh, all the way to where 95 is, White Marsh Perry Hall. I mean, it was a huge, huge um, plantation, really. And also at their height of their of this, uh, they, there were 300 enslaved and indentured servants who were here. So it wasn't the Lily White Ridgely's who kept this place going, it really was the enslaved people. Um, so the National Park Service has owned it since 1948. It's unusual for the National Park Service to have some place like this that it manages and owns 
It's usually because of a special event like the War of 1812 and Fort McHenry, or because of a famous person, George Washington and now Vernon. Now but but this is because um, it was it was really a very significant thing because the same family lived here for all those generations, for six generations. So from 1790 to uh, 1948 is when they lived here. And a lot of that, the National Park Service taking it over is because of this portrait of Eliza. Eliza was the third, I'll explain more too. Eliza was the third Mrs. Ridgely. And um, the portrait was painted by Thomas Sully, who's a fam who was a famous portrait painter at the time. Eliza was about 15, was painted probably in 1820, 1830. Um, in the 1940s, the National Gallery of Art in Washington was having a Thomas Sully exhibition. And a man by the name of David Finley knew that there was an original Thomas Sully portrait here. So he came up from Washington and bought it. This is a reproduction. The original is in Washington. But he saw this place and just liked the history of it, but also saw the paint was peeling, it was falling down, nobody needed iron ore anymore. It was really in dis disarray and um, greatly reduced in the was not 24,000 acres anymore. So David Finley put together um, it's called the Avalon Foundation, which was the precursor to the National Historic Trust, and they bought this, and then subsequently sold it to the National Park Service. So the, how, that's how the National Park Service got a hold of it. I'll talk to you later about, about that. There were, um, it was the, uh, the custom at the time that the oldest male child inherit this when somebody died, sort of like William and Harry in England, and um, so the six masters of um, Hampton are Charles, Charles, John, Charles, John, John. So you'll get the name right 50% of the time if you just remember Charles or John. Mm -hmm. um, this, uh, the Great Hall, they would have come in this way. Um, the carriage would have pulled up. Um, this room would not have exactly looked like this, but it was used for weddings, for funerals, um, larger banquets. Apparently they had 50 people at, you know, sometimes um, at a long table here for banquets. Um, so it was, it was a multi-purpose you know, room, if you will. And a lot of the artwork that's here probably wasn't you know, on the walls at the time. But the other thing I should tell you is that 90% of what is here, that, or what you see, belong to a Ridgely. That's really unusual. If you've gone to Monticello, home of Thomas Jefferson, 25 to 30% of what is there belonged to him. The family needed to sell it for taxes or donations or whatever. But 90% of what is here belonged to originally. Originally touched it, but it might be from the Civil War, not necessarily from 1790. Um, another thing to note: you'll see staghorns, um, like on the cornices there, but you'll see it throughout the house too. That was their family crest. And uh, a couple months ago, I had a young man here who goes to Ridgely Middle School, which is because Ridgely is named after, not too far away. And they, he said that their mascot is a, is a staghorn. Head. So it's all, and the streets around here are named after, um, there's a Staghead Lane or Road and just different people in the ridge themselves. Um, And I just walked in, I'm gonna, the bells are on the left, it's sort of our little Downton Abbey, I'm gonna ring a bell so you can see what that's like, and then I'll meet you down there where the bells are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ready for dinner. <laughs> Beautiful. There's dessert right there. Catch up with the tour. <laughs> so anyhow, this, I think the second bell, I don't know if anybody saw which it's bell. Okay, um, so each bell has a different tone. It was thought that the enslaved people could not read. And um, so each bell has a different tone, and they knew whether to go to the main bedroom, to the drawing room, to the foyer, or whatever, um, or parlor. Um, 
much like a mother knows her baby's cry, I guess more than anybody, mm -hmm. other than anybody else. So, um, so that's what that is. Um, there's only one still working. And then again, notice the locks. Um, of course, this one is a little more modern, but this we have one on the door you came into. This way is a lot, and it is very. Um, Eliza, who was the woman with the heart, the third Mrs. Ridgely, was here. Um, she reigned here from um, during the Civil War, and of course the Ridgleys weren't here all the time. They traveled a lot. Um, when they went to York, they were there for you know six months or a year at a time, not like we go for a week. And so they were, she was really concerned about the people that were working here, the enslaved people, when nobody was here, and they knew when they were gone. So it said that that's a lot of the locks are because of her. Mm -hmm. The house or whatever, it certainly looks like more of a prep kitchen, which is really what it was. But it's significant because in 1790, kitchens were not usually attached to the house because of fire. So this is actually a picture of what the kitchen was like outside. Um, and that's where they, they were here in the summer so that they could do it went much cooler out there and that's where they did most of the cooking. Um, and so it's not, there's not a lot to say in here. I would like you, I don't know if you've seen these before. These are called stew stoves and they were very state of the art then um, at the time. The wood goes underneath um, and it's sort of like a crock pot in that you can put a, um, I'm trying to modernize her. You can put a, a a pot in there, a stew or gravy or whatever, and it's a much more even heat than just heating it over the fire and everything just cooking that way. So feel free to come and look at those if you haven't seen them. And then having an oven was really unusual too. I think there's a picture. Of the oven. This is where the people that took care of the house lived. Um, there were about 20 people there. It's showcased, if you can see where it was, there's an octagonal herb garden outside. And that's where they lived, the people that took care of the house. This was really, though, like command central for the enslaved people because the people that were here taking care of the house knew what was going on, who was coming to visit, there was going to be a party, um, when the, the Ridgleys were going to be away, what's, you know, what's happening. And then they could go down and tell the people that the farmhands what was happening, who then could tell the people that worked in the ironworks. So it, it, this was really sort of the news. The, the newspaper or the radio of um, you know what was going on. Um, the other thing is, it's very, the brick is very warm there. That's because they had to bring all of the food, vegetables, everything, up across Hampton Lane, all the way around here. This is the working side of the house. This is the laundry was done outside. The um, the cooking was outside as well. So um, that that's what this was. And then this woman, um, Dinah Too Good. <laughs> Um, was said to make the best butter in Maryland. And so there's a lot of butter molds over there. They had, the Ridgley's had Jersey cows and Holstein cows. Apparently they gave very good, whatever you need for butter, cream, milk, whatever. Um, so they were really, um, you know, that was sort of the neat thing. Was she a slave? Yes, she was, she was. So this summer, um, I volunteered one, uh, anyhow, one weekend, um, about 50, um, African Americans from Lancaster and York counties came down to Hampton. And it had been because of the studies that are going on, and the, the Ridgeleys did keep names of people, you know, first names and last names. There were a number of people who were descendants of the enslaved people who worked here. It was very emotional for them and for us because one woman realized that her great aunt, great great aunt, um, had worked in the dairy, you know, she had, so it was really, really quite, um, it was quite cool, because a lot of, Maryland was one of the last states to free the enslaved people, and um, so when people sought free, when the enslaved people sought freedom, they ran north to Pennsylvania or over to Washington, D.C. There's a, there is a cool story about Lucy Jackson, who I mentioned before, who uh, lived upstairs when she was the, uh, in charge of the house, and uh, she was married to a free man, who gave her um, scarves or things like that as gifts. And her son also sought freedom and, and escaped and, and uh, was successful in doing that. So Lucy decided she was gonna do that, and she did. She went to D.C., was successful, and then once, um, after 1865, when it, and slavery went away, um, or people were emancipated, um, she, she went to a lawyer and wrote a letter, which they have, 
to the Ridgely saying, I want my clothes back, I want my scars, and I went, we don't know what happened, but I like to think that, she, you know, she was in charge, and she wanted to be in charge of her life and get those things back. So there's like, the Ridgely's were not good, um, you know, they were not, they, they had a plantation, they had a lot of enslaved um, people, but they, they did keep great notes, um, you know, lots of documentation. They also had first and last names of the people, and they did not, uh, usually divide up families when they bought them. Uh, so if there were you know, three children and a husband and wife, they would buy the whole family. <laughs> Don't have to take turns. Wow, this is nice. It's a little, I'll talk to Matt here, but everybody can take turns. Eliza married, so John is to the left of her, and they're not, there's not a big discrepancy in their ages. So Eliza was 15 when that was painted, and her um, husband John was older when it was painted. So they were the third Ridgely's. They were the one who traveled a lot. They had um, six, uh, six children, I think three lived. Diety was one of them, the one that had the pet squirrel, and then, you know, the squirrel escaped. And then the fourth, they, their oldest son, then we go back to Charles, and Charles married Margaretta, whose portrait is there. She was a Howard, so those of you from Maryland, Johnny Ur Howard was a military hero from the uh, Revolutionary War. There's a uh, Howard Street, a John Street, a Howard County, that, you know, he's very remembered. And Margaretta and Charles had six children. They were traveling in um, Rome, and uh, with all six of their children, and he contracted, um, con yeah, contracted diphtheria, typhoid, something terrible, and died. So when he was uh, 36, so she brought all the children back. But again, this place was, you know, was more of an agricultural um, farm. Um, didn't do tobacco like a lot of Southern Maryland and Southern Maryland did. But um, they were just trying to make do orchards. They, you know, they had orchards. So then their oldest son is, we go to John, who's a little more modern, his portrait is hanging over the dining room. And um, he was married to Helen Stewart Ridgely, we do not have a picture of her, but um, also a very formidable woman. Um, Well-read, well-educated, uh, um, drove, he did not drive. She was scared of electricity, and so the year after she died, which was 1928 or 29, that's when they electrified this house, which they certainly could have done earlier. She had, um, I don't want it, kind of thing. Right, right. Um, so this is set, this is the um, music room, as you can see. And um, it would be sort of like a family room in a way. Um, it would probably not have had this many things on the walls or whatever. But um, it's set, it's decorated very much as it would be for Christmas um, with the candles. Now, I can't, those candles I don't think would burn very long, so there probably had to be some enslaved people there lighting all the candles, taking the ones down or whatever. Um, notice the painted shades again here. Each one has a different instrument on, a musical instrument on it. Um, and then, oh, and there's the pet moment. There's a pet squirrel <laughs> in the cage, which they found. They were very excited about that this year. It has never been displayed before, not in my lifetime anyhow. Um, and then, let me see, the silver piece, those of you from Maryland, it was a Kirk Steve silver candy dish. Um, Margareta played the Steinway piano. And then usually in front of the music stand is a harp that was Eliza's. And um, right before COVID, it was sent to New York um, for re restoration. And it was something like $4,000 just to crate it, to send it up there. So it's, a, it's quite a big investment. Um, but then COVID delayed or whatever. But anyhow, it's supposed to be back in early spring. And it'll, it usually sits right in front of the, um, the music stand. 
So hopefully, you know, that'll be fun. Sometimes they have park concerts in the Great Hall, and that sort of thing to do. Um, this is a portrait of the governor, the one who had all the children, who liked fine wine, who liked horse racing, looking very formidable there. And his lovely wife, Priscilla, who had all the children, is in the oval frame, looking very tired. <laughs> yeah, she was pregnant half of I mean, she died at 56, so she was pregnant. Like, she was and then Dighty is a little girl with a little red riding hood cape. Um, that was Eliza's daughter. And then a lot of the other people are, you know, they're various ways. I can't tell you, you know, who they are. But, um, that's pretty much. But anyway, they, can't, they used to have, in fact, um, when they had candles on Christmas trees, they would have a box of sand next to the tree so they could put the candles up that way or in case there was fire. Um, they could, you know, <coughs> And this is an unusual piece, too. I was in the kitchen last week, and there was a snake. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to find. So anyhow, that's it. Thanks for coming. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you Happy, Happy New Year. Thank Stay you. healthy. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Enjoy having you. Happy New Year. Thank you so much. You're Thumbs welcome. Up. Hey, all right. Have a good weekend. Me too. All right, Matt. So we just wrapped up the tour. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Uh, very impressive. They said it was the biggest house in America at the time it was built, I guess in the 1780s, 1790. Um, you know, it's, what's interesting is how, how much space there is inside. I mean, from the, it's impressive from the outside, but once you start going in like with the kitchen and all the different rooms, and we were just on the lower level, um, you know, I was surprised just how how much is in there. Like, right, kind of, right. Kind of we saw a lot, yeah. yeah, but we didn't get to go upstairs at all. No, and there was. The second level. Didn't she say that there was how many bedrooms on the the, the third floor? I or, think okay. she said six. Yeah. I don't know. What, I believe she said six. Um, but you know, I love seeing the paintings. Yeah, the paintings were cool. Members. I think that's really really interesting in any of these uh, historic homes when you see the paintings and immortalize the family. Um, yeah, very nice. Yeah. And hearing about the travels to Europe and some of the things that they brought back to decorate the home. Wasn't uh, the, the piano from John Jacob Astor? Yes, yeah, the music room was in it. Yeah, yeah, that was really uh, cool. interesting with the Christmas tree, yeah. Um, and also just, you know, seeing how all the different, uh, both the you know, the servants and the enslaved people and the family just all lived together and kind of functioned and operated in the same house together. Right, right. All the different rooms and how they were connected. I thought it was interesting that they gave the slaves the Christmas presents. Yeah. And they had a list yeah. in there of uh, what they gave to whom. Right. So that was uh, kind of interesting. But yeah, what a beautiful mansion. Yeah, what I love about a guided tour like that is it really... Uh, gives you a sense of the people yes, who live in the home. Yes. It's not just the structure, but really the, the people and their, right. uh, you know, their personalities, their relationships with each other. That you really come away with a good understanding of them, of the, of the people who own the home. Right. We noticed this as we were walking back to the parking lot. And here's uh, what it is. Hey, ice cream in July. This is an ice house built in 1790. There it is, down there. And you can see how far down it goes. And it says here, having ice in the summertime was a real luxury in the early 19th century. Storing enough ice to last throughout the summer was a true feat though. There we go. This gotta be pretty deep. Yeah, I think so. You're looking at the picture, it's it says that the men entered the cavity through the passage and packed the ice down, often pouring water over it to make it freeze. Oh, so you know what we're looking at here, I realize this, this is just the steps leading down to, I guess. Yes, like that's the steps, cellar. right, right. And then that, that uh, It looks like this, this right, right here yeah. is that. Yeah, well, that's really deep then. Yeah, yeah, look at that, mm -hmm. my goodness. All right, so we are back to where we started from. 
We just finished the tour back there, came outside, did a little more walking. We're gonna wrap things up now, but I wanna to talk to Matt a little bit. Again, he's the one that suggested coming here to Hampton's uh, mansion. And uh, he also has a YouTube channel. Tell us about your channel, Matt. Sure, it's, uh, it's youtube.com and the handle is at Matt Barry Movies. It's Matt Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, Movies. Uh, it's a lot of short films, comedy videos, and I'm starting to do more uh, little travel videos and vlogs, kind of inspired by what Pete's doing here, just to get out and explore our own backyard. It is a lot of fun to do. Now, I've seen some of his shorts and they are a lot of fun. So I want you to be sure to check them out. I'm gonna post the link in the comments below and I'll post it right up here so you guys can see it. There it is. Okay, and uh, I'm sure you'll probably get to see Matt again because uh, he has some other ideas too. And uh, I also told him, if you ever need me in one of his shorts, be happy to be in it. So uh, again, you know, look for that. But yeah, Matt, thank you so much yeah. for the suggestion and, and coming out and meeting today. And it, again, what a beautiful day to be outside. I mean, it's for January 30th. I mean, I'm sorry, December 30th jumping ahead there it's a i mean you can't beat this weather especially yeah. after you know eight degrees last weekend so and thank you so much for inviting me to tag along today it was a lot of fun guys i'm a big fan of pete's vlogs so it was oh, a you. pleasure to finally be able to actually be in one and yeah on a little trip with you a little day trip and uh <laughs> I, 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 like I say, it just gets you inspired to go out and see what's out there. And just a little uh, quick note, Matt and I, we know each other from a Laurel and Hardy group. We're big Laurel and Hardy fans. So that's how we met. And uh, we just love Laurel and Hardy and the old comedy, you know, Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, Three Stooges. That's another story. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Hope you had a lot of fun checking out the mansion with us. Until the next time, I want you to be a good human being. Take good care of each other. Share a smile and be the reason why you smile. So until next time, this is Pizza and Peace for Matt. Right. Bye, Happy everyone. New Year. Happy yeah, New Year. Yeah. See you on the next one.